Randy Daniel, and Randy is a Marine veteran who served as an operations specialist, and that's not former Marine or retired Marine, it's a Marine veteran. Later, he interviewed and was accepted into the 11th Counterintelligence Team, which conducted counterterrorism, counterespionage, and counter-subversion operations. He is the president of ACT for America, America's Jacksonville chapter and a national mentor. ACT has over 800 chapters nationwide and is responsible for several pieces of legislation to protect America from radical Islam, to include working for the passage of American laws for American courts, which prevents Islamic Sharia laws being used in American courts when they violate the state and the U.S. Constitution. He is among a select group of individuals invited to participate in the Strategic Engagement Group's Train the Trainer program an intensive immersion course conducted by leading national experts from various agencies, private government think tanks, and other experts on the Islamic movement, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, counterterrorism, constitutional studies, postmodernism, and subversion, to name with you. Boy, that was a mouthful. <laughs> so let's welcome Randy Mc McDaniel. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your service, sir. God bless. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to first of all thank you, uh, the Tea Party Network for having me here today. This is an important issue. There are a lot of important issues before us today. Um, I want to thank uh, Stan and uh, Ms. Patane, Ms. Beck, and all you guys that, that, that have had me here today. And I'm glad that you've decided to take this or consider this legislation for the upcoming season to get it passed. Um, it's something we've tried to pass here in Florida for three years now. It's passed the House overwhelmingly. It's passed the Senate this past year. They gave it extra hurdles and made it go through four committees, including uh, Children and Family Services, which I didn't expect it to get through, and it did. Um, but for one reason or another, we've, in the Senate, we've, our Senate leadership has failed to bring it up for an up or down vote. And so your participation in this is going to be huge, and uh, I look forward to it. Um, as we begin, i got to ask one question. I know it's redundant, but despite all the controversy, I mean, the state of America today, how many of you here in this room still believe that America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth? Please give me a hand. Outstanding. I'm in the right place. And if we maintain our republic, it's going to be because of leaders like you that have reached out to the grassroots movement and effected the change. And I want to give everybody, please give yourselves a big applause. Hand. Thank you. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics and bore you with a bunch of legal ease on ALAC. What I want to do is tell you why it's important and that Islamic law is being used every day in American courts. Every single day it is being used to, to the detriment of not only some Americans, but really the Muslims that came here in America to escape barbaric Sharia laws, and they're being affected by, by it and without due process, and our courts are actually enforcing these foreign laws on U.S. soil every day. And I'm going to explain a little bit how that's happening. Now, we can all agree that America in this room, I know that I don't have to tell you and ask the question that we have enemies. I think you know that we have foreign enemies. And two of the major enemies I look at, fascism, when you look at social fascism, communism, Islamism, whatever ism you want to call it, we have people that are enemies of this country that want to bring it down and extinguish our light of liberty. And so goes America, so goes the world. We are the Holy Grail. And if you don't think that they're working every day to bring us down, they are, and I think you guys get that. Uh, especially there's a deal with Common Core. And I'm also going to show you a lot of links between Common Core and Islamism. I don't have time to go into great detail. Now, I just got back from D.C. I was there for the Million Muslim March and the Bikers for D.C. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little punchy, get a little off tangent. Um, it's just because I haven't slept much in about five days. I'm um, running about four hours sleep a night, so I had to get back here and get this presentation put together um, because I didn't anticipate going. Um, good news and bad news. Yes, sir. Excuse me for interrupting, sir. I think you'd be more comfortable if you take off your chat. <laughs> we'll do that. Yeah. And we had Ted do it, too. <laughs> now, um, let me get my timer here going because I will get off track if I don't put it on. And uh, I will be... I want to make sure I get through this. I'm going to show you a short clip here in a moment of one of the fire department, New Yorker fire departments, was on the ground, and they were a couple of the bikers I interviewed. I can give you tons of clips. But, you know, we had one group 
And before, well, before I get into this, when I was talking about these two groups, you got to understand that a lot of people, when you hear about ALAC, you hear a lot of Muslims saying they're trying to suppress our religion, our freedom. Uh, you know, we have two gods worshipped here. Uh, the god of communism is atheism. The father of atheism is disbelief in God and Satan. I'm a Christian. I believe that. You have another god, God of Allah. And again, I look at that and look who the god of that religion is. When you look into it, it's a dark religion. And so we have two entities. And one actually claims responsibility for creating the others. Because if you look at Islam, it's tribal in nature. It's communal in nature. Communism. It all comes together. And if you look at the Egyptian charter, it says we were a socialist, democratic, Islamic nation ruled by Sharia law. There's really no incompatibility between it other than the God they worship. And, and they, ultimately, it's really the same God as how they get there. Um, what I want to get to right now is the biker, two million bikers. We had two groups up there. And there was a big contrast. They want to describe America as bigots, racist, you know, we're intolerant, and try to say these things about Americans. But the interesting thing that I found when I interviewed these guys, and I watched men, big, grown, strong men, break into tears. And they had nothing bad to say other than not on this day. Just not today. We don't care if they march. Just not today. Um, we, don't, we have no problem against another faith or another religion. Now, on the other hand, I understood what the Million Muslim March is. Because there was just another Million Muslim March in Bangladesh, and they planned her for this Million Muslim March, and that Million Muslim March are the same guy, Rabi Alam. Just so happens that their protesting in Bangladesh was much more successful. The one here in Washington had nine Muslims, yeah. including the speakers. The rest were troopers. The one in Bangladesh had a significant Muslim turnout, but was a failure for a couple of reasons. They were protesting against it's a 90% Muslim nation. And the Muslim nation backlashed against its own nation and elected a secular government to office. Jamaat-e Islami, a very radical group, Rabi Alamis Tiger, the plan of the organization, was protesting for Sharia law and overthrowing secular law. This is the same guy that held the Million Muslim March against fear, later changed out to the Million American March against fear when it did not have traction. So the ulterior motive of the group in DC as far as I'm concerned, in my knowledge, I understand who and what that was about, really. It was not about intolerance or bigotry, it was about something deeper. Now, I'm gonna show you a clip real quick of one of the firefighters, and I think this speaks volumes to the American character.
Obviously, that's why everybody else is here. God bless his country. God bless your brother. Kind of a big contrast between one group and the other, I think. And I think that speaks volumes again on the day that we lost 3,000 Americans, close to 3,000 Americans. And a million Muslim march with the insensitivity we had on that particular day. No one, that was the only condemnation that was, uh, I'm sorry. The only condemnation they had was that particular day. You know, so again, I think that speaks volumes for the American spirit. And uh, God bless you for that. Come on. Is going this is not cooperating? Is it still... Um, I think it's a microphone from Sid. I apologize. I don't. Would you like me to sit up there and get manually move it? I might have to have somebody do that if it's not going to work. What do I press? Just the uh, arrow forward or the arrow backwards to write it. See if it's working now. No. So. All right. That's fine. Just leave it over to that. One of the things that I want to show you is if people talk about, first of all, to understand American laws and why it's important, I think you have to know, first of all, is there a need for American laws for American courts? Is Sharia a threat to our nation? Is there, are those laws being implemented on our soil? And why is the need there? So I want to explain a couple things. A lot of people talk about Islam being a religion, and, and the reason that they're mad at us is because of our foreign policy. Well, I looked at the Founding Fathers. If you look at the Founding Fathers, anybody remember the Barbary Pirates? Those were Muslim pirates. And for 30 years we paid tribute because they attacked and took our worships without provocation. Took our men into slavery, captured our goods. And Thomas Jefferson, if you would, Vince and, and uh, Adams wrote and they asked the ambassador for, for uh, Tripoli why this was occurring. You know what I mean? I'm just... Let me, uh, something's a Pittsburgh up, I think. Something's happening to the computers. They don't want to talk to each other or something. There we go. I don't know how that happened. Okay, that's it. going to have to, I don't know. In the show, let me restart this. There we go. Basically asked why they were attack attacking without provocation. And this was the reply from the ambassador from Tripoli. It was founded on our laws and written in our Quran that it was our right and duty to make war to make slaves all they could take as prisoners. So they talked about the Quran and being a legal system, a law, not a religion. John Quincy Adams said there's a law of nations that basically the state of nations and Christian nations was a state of peace. But there was a Mohammedan law that the state of nations was not a state of peace, but a state of war. But, but, uh, that one. That's all right. I knew it was. Hassan al-Banna, you just got to hit it one time when you hit. Um, Hassan al-Banna said it was the nature of Islam to dominate and to pose its law on all nations and extend Islam to the entire planet. That sounds like a totalitarian ideology to me. And Islam broke the world at the inception under the Prophet Muhammad in the two, the Dara Islam and the Dara Harb. The Dara Islam is the house of submission. The Dara Harb is a house of war. Now some people say religion, Islam is a religion of peace. I'll concede to that. It is a religion of peace. The Dara Islam is the wage war against the Dara Harb until it comes under submission of the Dara Islam. Then and only then will it be peace. Once the whole of the world is won for Islam, there will be peace. So Islam is truly a religion of peace when you hear that. Now, Sharia law is in many countries. The birthplace in 20% of the world is Shia Muslim. That's out of Persian wing, which is out of Iran and Iraq. Do they have Sharia law in Iran? Do they, do they behead in, 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 Iraq, in Iraq? Do they stone people there? Absolutely. So you go to the birthplace of the Sunni law, the Sunni sects, which is Iran, I mean, I, I mean uh, Saudi Arabia, 
80% of the world is Sunni, but the birthplace is Saudi Arabia. Do they behead there? Do they stone there? Do they kill and enforce the barbaric Islamic Sharia law? Yeah. Absolutely. So I don't think there's any disagreement through both sects. I'm saying, what about the peaceful sects? We'll get to that in a moment. I'm not bashing Muslims. I have Muslim friends. I have some that claim to be Muslims. I refer to them as cultural Muslims, or Muslims in name only, Minos, kind of like a rhino. You know? Um, they don't practice the religion. They don't pray five times a day. They don't adhere to the Quran, and they don't adhere to Sharia law. That's the difference. And political Islam, or Sharia, is a political system, and it has all tenets. It has religious components, judicial, legal, military components, and so on. Um, as far as the, uh, the world view, they say that we don't have a caliphate. A couple things I want to have people understand. What is the largest organization in the world today? United Nations, right? NGO? The second largest organization in the world today is an organization of Islamic Cooperative, which was formed in the Organization of Islamic Conference made up of 57 Islamic states or nations. That is a caliphate, and they are directing it. They invented the word Islamophobia, and they are moving their 10-year plan to silence any speech which is offensive to Islam or the Prophet Muhammad or hurts the spread of Islam through UN Resolution 1618, defamation of religions. General S.K. Malik, the chronic concept of war. You have a nation, and you don't understand that the Quran is a book, a political book, which has religious components in it, then take a look at S.K. Malik's book, which when Pakistan was set up, he wrote it, the chronic concept of war, and they based their whole war and their whole military system on the writings of the Quran. Then you have Hassan al-Banna, who I wrote, read a moment ago, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood after Ataturk secularized Turkey. Turkey was an Islamic nation, the seat of the caliphate, and when they disbanded it and made it westernized, modeled it after America and other western countries, and banned the burqa, banned prayer on the streets, the Islamists got upset. And in 1920, Hassan al-Banna founded the Muslim Brotherhood with only two goals. To reestablish the global Islamic state, the caliphate, keyword global, and two, extend Sharia law worldwide, all nations, period. Maududi and Kutub, I'm not going to get into because we have uh, to get through a lot, but you just have to know that Said Kutub wrote a book called Milestones after visiting America in the 50s. He thought we were so decadent in the 50s that he wrote a manifesto called Milestones, Increments. What's a milestone? Stages. Everything's gradual, and I'll talk a little bit about progressive revelation, how we get there. But this is very important to understanding and lay a foundation before I get into ALAP, so you understand this. Maududi, now Said Kutub represents the Arab side of Islam. And Maududi, who describes the Muslims as the members of a political party, and the political party is Islam, and it's a revolutionary ideology, and that it has to extend its revolutionary ideology or program to the whole world. And this is written in English, and you can get it called Jihad um, by Abu Maududi. And he talks and lays it right out. Said Kutu does as well. As revolutionary, they both explain Islam as a revolutionary political system to rule over all of the world. And these two guys have refueled the, the jihad and spawned pretty much virtually every Islamist terrorist group in the world today. Um, period. And by the way, all of it is based on the authoritative, I kind of skipped over that, I'll cover it. Here, just leave it, it's fine. It's all based on Islamic authoritative Islamic law, which is derived from one, the Quran, to the Sunnah, which is made up of the biography of Muhammad, and the Hadith, which is the traditions of Muhammad. After that, there were 337,000 Hadith out that nobody knew it was true or was false. And every scholar of the day got together about a thousand years ago, and they had what's called Ijtihad, or human reasoning. They went through and said, hey, these are false Hadith, let's get rid of them. These, these are weak Hadith, and these are strong Hadith. The strong hadith are written by Muslim and by Bukhari. And they said it, it's pretty much the end of the story. Once they did that, they voted on it, they had to have 100% scholarly consensus. I mean, every scholar had to vote yes or no, give it an up or down vote, and it made it into the book. And they had consensus, or what they call it, Since then, the gates to Ijtihad, or human reasoning, have been closed. So anybody tells you that you can reform Islam, that you can change the law, it's not true. Dr. Zudi Jasser is a prime example. He's been in America advocating American Islamic Forum for Democracy and speaking against Sharia law and Fox News. He's a friend. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. He's literally an apostate from the religion. He's an enemy of the state, according to Islamic doctrine. Now, 
Say again. No, you're fine. Did it go? No, you you were on the right page. But uh, did you uh, did you go ahead? I want to briefly explain a couple doctrines which are very important. Actually, you need to go back. Um, yes, go back one more. Progressive revelation, great. What I talked about a moment ago very briefly was progressive revelation. And what I mean by that is everything that, that Islamists do to conquer other countries, and I'm not saying every Muslim in America is doing this, but their science is kind of an indicator of where they stand. They're not going to stand against, and there's slander laws and reasons I'm not going to get into death. But there are three main periods. The first period is the first Meccan period, where Muhammad began speaking his religion. I'll use that term loosely. He knew that he had to get along to go along. That's the Dawah phase, the outreach phase. We smile in the faces of some while we curse them in our hearts. We're not allowed to take non-believers as our friends. We can take them as friends outwardly, but never inwardly. That is doctrine out of the Quran. So we need to make friends while we wage our war until we get large enough. Thirteen years Muhammad taught in the Dawah phase in Mecca before he started getting too aggressive. He started pushing a little too hard, and the Meccans understood what was going on. It was a revolutionary ideology and not a religion, and they ran him out forcibly. And he claimed it ran out to the Jews and Christians of Medina and said, look, they're persecuting me just because I want to wish it all. And so what happened was they took him in, they claimed victim status. Muhammad's elected a political leader, and then later he's elected as a military leader. And eventually he drove out two of the Jewish tribes that took him in, and he killed eight to 900 men of the Khorizi tribe and took their war booty. Then began what they called defensive jihad, or phase two, the Medina period. After that, he went to phase three, which is the offensive jihad. He marched back into Mecca with an army of 10,000 men and took Mecca without a fight. And since then, Islam has spread as a political military system ever since. But they use those components. It's progressive revelation. In the country that you are in, if you're first there, you're going to be in phase one. Sometimes you're going to be in phase two. And this is where Al-Qaeda and the Brotherhood are beginning to work together more and more. But people say, look, they hate each other. One's against each other. No, they're not. They all, the OIC, Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, every one of them. Same Quran, same Sharia, same doctrine. The only difference between violent jihadis like Hezbollah, Hamas, and Al-Qaeda overseas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and other groups inside the United States is tactics and timing. Right now is not the time. The Muslim Brotherhood believes they're still in Dawah phase moving into to, uh, offensive, uh, defensive jihad. Al-Qaeda believes they're in offensive jihad. Where are we there? That's the only difference. So when you see them working together, they say, look, this is more modern. No, no such thing. If you're an Islamist, you're an Islamist, you're an Islamist. You're either inherent or you're not inherent. One of the two. You're either an apostate or you're a Muslim. One of the two. That's it. Come on. Oh, did it change? Yeah. Okay. Quickly, the types of jihad, I kind of just went over this a little bit. Here in America, we were working still in cultural jihad, speaking about Islam, blowingly, writing articles, hatred in the heart. And the next one, we have a Sharia compliant finance here in America. Um, we actually have a sinister financial tool, which is a Trojan horse to insinuate Sharia in America. Muslims claim they can't pay or receive interest. Well, according to the Islamic law, the Umdad Asali on Riba, book W.35 talks about Riba, and you can both receive and pay interest in foreign or enemy lands. However, as Americans, they come and say, we can't pay that, it's against our religion. We need to have Sharia compliant finance. And right now, we have $2.4 trillion that comes into U.S. banks under that form, and they have to give it, it did to zakat, Islamic charity. Give it. It's only to Muslims. There are eight categories. The problem with that is the seventh category in Book H, which talks about zakat, is those fighting in the cause of Allah. It means we are financing 2.5 percent of the annual wealth of that product has to go to jihad. So we are financing terrorism against ourselves right now. You bank with Chase Manhattan, uh, USB, HSBC, uh, AIG. Um, Wells Fargo, a number of banks, you are financing terrorism against ourselves. And we have oversight boards that actually sit on it and do this type of work. And then they finally jihad the tower. The next thing is migration. And these two things are important. I, I'm covering just a little bit of things, but migration, the first mosque planted in America, is the house of migration, the Dharahidra. Just as Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina and became a political leader, that was the first flag planted on U.S. soil, saying, hey, we're here, and it's a very radical mosque. In fact, um, Omar Awalaki, who used to pray in the, in the capital, uh, was the leader of that. We killed him subsequently. Also, two of the 9 11 hijackers went to that mosque as well. Um, and again, everything is based on the actions of the Prophet Muhammad and the media, initially politically and then increasingly military. Again, I kind of covered that when I went into it. So, hopefully, 
Um, and then here's Muhammad Badi. This is the Supreme God. Just to make sure that nothing's changed between 1928 and today, Muhammad Badi was the, was the last uh, Supreme God of the Global Muslim Brotherhood. And he said, the Brotherhood is a global movement whose members cooperate with each other throughout the world based on the same religious worldview, the spread of Islam until it rules the world. There's no disagreement. And I'm going to show you a clip in 2009 at the Capitol that's going to start playing here in a moment. Muslim. My father is a Muslim. My grandfather is a Muslim. All my family is Muslim. Sharia law. I heard that mention. Sharia. What Sharia is. And it's a Sharia. Muslims live by Sharia. Sharia is like the law. The Muslims law. Yes, sir. It's the Muslims law. Yes. See, they put everything that will, like the Constitution, like everything. Anything you do in life, you have to go by Sharia. Sharia is the law, the constitution of the Muslims. That's what it is. And here it's fine. Do you think the Muslim community would like to see Sharia law in America? Of course. Could I ask you another question? Um, earlier, the reason is that so apostasy from Islam is not a Catholic. You don't believe it should be a capital or a punishment or to be gay or to be homosexual in Islam? Or it, it, it's, against, it's against our religion. It's not acceptable at all to be a homosexual. Uh, that's our religion. Let, let me finish. Let me, let me finish. Yes, sir. See, you're pointing everything about Islam. Point not only Islam, neither Christianity allow this. And I think the punishment is the same. Neither Judaism. We always point about what Islam said. No, Christianity doesn't. They, doesn't, they, accept, they accept homosexuality. They don't, they don't agree with it. The religion itself, but they don't have capital punishment for homosexuality. Well, well, we have capital punishment. You do have capital punishment for homosexuality. Yes. But if Sharia law was accepted in America, <laughs> Capital, uh, and, and being homosexual capital, do you believe that we should kill? Homosexual? I mean, we kill, we, we kill, we kill for everything. Well, I mean, we kill, we kill for a pair of Nike shoes. We kill for uh, everything. I mean, I in jurisprudence in the court of law under Sharia law, yeah. that's acceptable. And if Sharia law were implemented in America, do you believe that we should, we should follow? If, should, if, if Sharia law was implemented in this, then you're going to be killed. Yes. Didn't make no bones. It's kind of refreshing to see someone that's honest, but basically he said what he meant. Muslims in America want Sharia law. He said it was their constitution. I thought that Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution said it should be the supreme law of the land. So we have a competing legal system, governing system, that wants to be implemented in the United States, and those that held the Million Muslim March were advocating just for that, to implement Sharia. And we have Sharia being implemented through uh, every day, like I said, and this is why ALAC is so important, because it will take away some of that uh, implementation or ability to, to rule by Sharia in America. In our schools right now, the largest, the number one selling book, if you don't think they're not, they're teaching Sharia here, they're teaching children to be loyal citizens to the Islamic State and not the U.S. Constitution. This book, What Islam uh, What Islam's All About, by Yahya Emery, is the number one book used in madrasas or Islamic schools in the United States today. And it says, quote, on page 381, Muslims know that Allah is the supreme being in the universe. Therefore, his laws and commandments must be the basis for all human affairs. 377, the basis of all legal and political systems is Sharia Pala, the main sources of the Quran and the Sunnah. Muslims is dream of establishing the power of Islam in the world. So basically, aren't they teaching that Sharia should be the law of the land and not the U.S. Constitution on U.S. soil. Yeah. It goes further. They have another page which actually compares our judicial, executive, and uh, le uh, legislative branch to the Qadi, the, sh the uh, Shura courts, and the Caliphate. So they're setting this up to understand that we are, we're, we're not diametric opposed. We're, you know, the Sharia is compatible with the Constitution. Go ahead, get a couple times. So I got a couple things just talking about one more time. And one more. That's it. What Islam's all about? The duty of a Muslim citizen is to be loyal to the Islamic State. They say it right in the book. This is being taught in schools here. So if you don't think that we have a threat, <laughs> you, need to, you need to get on board. Um, some implementation of Sharia, and I'm sorry there are some children in here. These are pretty graphic. That's Estonia in the top left. These gentlemen were hung um, for sodomy. Um, sodomy, while it goes on all the time, and, in uh, the Middle East, it, it's not considered sodomy unless you have an intimate relationship. Uh, this right here is a young boy. This is a Sharia law being administered. The, 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 the camel's nose under the tent is saying, hey, we want Sharia for family law. 
We want it for contracts. We want it for benign things. What that leads to is less benign things like this child and his father is forced to put his arm down and run a car over his arm and break it because the child, his crime, stole a loaf of bread. Next. Again, Sharia, how it's being enforced in the United States by legal, before we get into ALAC, how is it being enforced? Well, there's choice of venue, there's choice of law, and there's comedy. Right now, every day through comedy, a Muslim male decides that he wants to divorce his wife. When he divorces his wife under Sharia law, first of all, he just says three times merely, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. It's done. He keeps the children, the wife is put out penniless, the only thing that she may keep is a one-eighth of a dowry or money that she may have had established as a prearranged thing, otherwise she gets nothing. So a Muslim male can go home from the United States, get a divorce without his wife present, no due process, come back to the United States with a legal order from a country that we um, respect and have comedy with, set it down in front of a judge, and he stamps it, orders it, hands it to a marshal, and says, go enforce this order. That's happening every day. And the people that are suffering are the children, and the wives, in some cases the husband, uh, one case in Maryland. So it's happening all the time. Now, the, the, the opponents of this law will tell you that it affects family law, um, that there's no need for it. The Constitution already says Article 6 is the supreme law of land. There's no necessity for it, and therefore, why do this? And that basically it's oppressive and it's an anti-Sharia bill. This still, unlike the bill in Oklahoma, SQ 755, which was bad legislation initially, and Act for America knew that it was going to fail. We pumped several thousands of dollars out there and had, had manpower of 30,000 activists um, help get that law passed. And it passed overwhelming 70% voted yes. We knew it was going to get overturned, but we needed to make sure the legislators understood that this was important to Americans. And so that's why the push was. Since then, that law was overturned, but ALAC, the good legislation that we that was written by David Rushalami and that we're a part of pushing, and that we're trying to get passed here in Florida is passed in seven states. The last state to pass it was North Carolina just a couple months back. So it is passed, and it's never been challenged in the court once because it does not single out Sharia, it does not single out Islam or any religion. It simply states that if any foreign law goes against state constitution or against U.S. constitution, then it cannot be used, period. So it protects the constitutional rights, including the rights of Muslims who come here seeking to escape those barbaric laws and have equal due process and equal rights. So it is a good law, a law that we need to pass, and we need to understand that, that the, the stuff that you're hearing out there just isn't so. And they'll say, look, it got overturned in Oklahoma. Yeah, it did. That was bad legislation. AMAC didn't get overturned. And the other way that they're doing it is through so choice of legal system. So one of the ways is they choose, hey, we want to rule under Sharia. We want to make an agreement. What if a, of course, when you get married under Sharia and you write your contract under Sharia, it's written narrative. So it's binding and Arabic. So you, here's a Muslim male who comes to the United States and marries a, a non-Muslim non woman who can't read it. She gets married and she may not even understand the legal document that she's signing. And now she's born to a foreign law which negates her rights to due process, negates her right to keep her children, and those types of things. That's one way it could be implemented. The other way is choice of venue. We can choose a, a foreign court to rule in. So we want to rule in accordance with Sharia law like in Saudi Arabia. So when we have a dispute or arbitration, we go there. Or we can tell the court we want to rule under those laws here in the United States where you arbitrate it and they arbitrate it here. That's another way. And the third way, which I've already discussed, was comedy. So those are how Sharia laws are being used every day in America. Um, now, the other thing is that's the same as Catholic canon law or Jewish halakha law. And if you enact this alayhah, isn't it going to affect those laws? The answer is no. And first of all, you have to understand also that under Jewish, can, uh, Jewish halakha law, and under Catholic canon law, they recognize the law of the land as the rules. They, they live by the law of the land. That means that the Constitution is the law, they live under the Constitution, unlike Sharia. Sharia does not recognize the law of the land, as you saw moments ago, that only Allah's law can be obeyed. Also, Jewish halakha law and Catholic canon law does not seek to impose its laws on top of others outside the religion. Not so under Sharia Islamic law, as you saw. They will push their laws. Now, when they conquer any lands, you had free status as a non-Muslim. If you were a person of the book, a Jew or a Christian, you could either convert, you could pay a jizya, 51% of your annual wealth, in a very demeaning way publicly each year. They would come down, grab you by the chin, by your beard, punch you in the chin, you hand your money up subdued, and you had to give your money. And then if a Muslim were walking down the street, you would cross the road, 
Um, you couldn't build your house taller than Muslims. Your church could be built, rebuilt or repaired. Those types of things. But you could live as a protected status. status. Kind of like the mafia. We'll protect you if you pay us some money. You know, otherwise accidents might happen. Um, by the way, the belt that we were wearing right now, the tunic, that came from there. That's how they knew you were a Christian and why you were supposed to get up and give up your seat when you had to cross the road. Um, the yellow star that Hitler used, that also was used, and that was an invention of the Muslims, not of Hitler. And that's how they identified Jews and Christians. So we were very, um, the golden age, as they said, in Andalusia or Spain, or Cordoba House, was not such a golden age. Um, that's a reference to the Ground Zero Mosque, by the way. The Cordoba House, and that's what they relate to, and that's what I'm talking about. So, Sharia laws, are they being used here in America? Well, Frank Gaffey, a friend of mine, did a study called the uh, on Sharia law, and they found out that in 23 states, in over 50 cases, just what they found, the most egregious cases, were in fact stated, you can go to this site, you can get a copy, you can read the case yourself. The most egregious case that I think happened was in New Jersey. Uh, where a woman was beat to the point of hospitalization, he was, she was raped by her husband, and the judge ruled in her fa in his favor because it was right, his right under Sharia law to both beat his wife and take her any time he wanted. Thankfully, it was overturned in the appellate court. Another case was a case in Maryland, which is kind of alluded, alluded to earlier, um, but this one here was a woman who was going to get a divorce from her husband. And the court ruled in the husband's favor. He went home under that foreign law, said, I divorce you three times, and was granted a divorce. The court ruled in his favor because she didn't show up in that foreign court saying she should have showed up. She said, wait a minute. She says, I'm living with another man. Under Sharia laws in my country, if I go back, they will kill me for, 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 for adultery. I'll be tried for adultery and most likely be killed. The court recognized that, said we understand, and still ruled in his favor. Here in America. And she had applied for the divorce in the Maryland court. That court was also overturned in appellate court later. But the, if you think that it's not happening, it is happening because judges don't understand it. The good news is, and if you'll, I'll get to that in a moment, I'm kind of getting ahead. Um, this legislation has already been used in Kansas to overturn and protect someone from just those type of laws. So it is working, we know. Uh, could you advance the slide for me? Oh, I'm trying. All right. My bad. All right. The 50 cases, 21 of them dealt with Sharia law marriages, 17 cases child custody, five were with uh, Sharia law contract, three dealt with Sharia doctrine, two were Sharia property law, one with due process, equal protection, and one was Sharia law and child custody. So those were just 50 cases where they had the wrong or Sharia law was implemented wrongly in over 23 states in this initial findings. Thank you. Can you advance again? Now, this one here, I popped up another one right here. This is child, eight-year-old girl. She died at the hands of her husband because of internal bleeding at a 40-year-old man. I bring that up is because the next slide will kind of amaze you because, oh, you skipped up. No? You went the other way. Hopefully we'll get, go back, keep going back, back, back and up. Oh, I don't know where it's at. Anyways, what there was is actually a poster from Great Britain. Britain has allowed the camel's nose to get into the tent. They have Sharia courts there now. And what happened was, right now they're having such a problem with um, abuse and child marriage and those types of things, rape, that they have a hotline for it in Britain. And that's what I was going to show you was their hotline. That the government is actually spending a huge amount of money for programs against this type of thing. And by the way, we had our first Sharia compliant court, family law court, approved in Richardson, Texas in 2008. This is Florida. These are four cases right here in Florida alone. So if you don't think it's in Florida, it is. These are the four cases that are listed in, in the state that have ruled um, Sharia law has been in the court system. Next, please. And again, I talked about the, uh, I covered this kind of with the Oklahoma. Um, SB 70, 755, which is thing about Sharia, was bad legislation. It was written poorly, and uh, we've gotten that uh, that didn't affect ALAC, and ALAC is in place. So if you hear somebody tell you, well, listen, they got to overturn in Oklahoma, not true. The bad legislation did. And you can go, go ahead, Kansas District, I covered that. And that's pretty much it. I really wanted to kind of show you a layout of case that there is a need for, for this law. Does anybody here disagree with what you've seen? Do you think that there's a need for the ALAC? 
American All Star Imports, please raise your hands if you believe that we have a need for it after seeing the video. So there's not anybody who's not convinced that, that there is creeping Sharia into our legal system? Yes, sir. I'm, I believe that anyone worshiping Islam, the Quran, is guilty of sedition. It should not be allowed in this country, period, because their goal, their goal is to overthrow our government. And that is the definition of sedition. And so that requirement says, not on this day, I say not on any day. Well, <laughs> As a Marine, I'm going to tell you, I, I, here's where I'll differ. Um, Dr. Zudi Jasser it speaks out against Sharia. He has a hard time. He has no legal basis, you're right. Legally, Islam, exactly. Islam in the face itself is not a, it's a legal system. It's a political system. Are there Muslims who do not want to adhere to Sharia and want to kind of have their own personal Islam? Yes. And that's why I say individual Muslims, I don't look at it that way because I don't know who they pray to in their heart. I know that Dr. Zudi Jasser doesn't believe it. Does he have a legal basis to practice the Islam that he practices? No. Somewhere else. Right? He doesn't know. He doesn't have a legal basis because he's a, he's, he doesn't believe in Sharia law. According to Islamic law, according to all four Islamic texts, the Quran, the Sunnah, um, the uh, Sharia law, man, he is an apostate officially according to Islam. But here in America, we're allowed to practice any faith we want. And under us, if he wants to practice his own personal Islam, that means only obey or take care of those religious components that are nonviolent, non-political in nature, he can, and I support that, um, because as a Marine, I fought for all religious faiths. So what I'm telling you is we have cultural Muslims in America, many of them, that don't believe this and don't practice this ideology, but the ones driving the train, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Muslim Student Association, Islamic Circle North America, the North American Islamic Trust, which owns 80% of the mosques and Islamic centers in America, they do. Um, before I go on with quick Q&A, how much time do I have, because I don't know. I have a half hour? So I must have went much quicker than I thought. It's 2 o'clock now. We started at 1.15. Technically, you're supposed to end at 15 minutes. The finish of the kind of stuck on the other side. Ah, well, I've got 15 minutes or whatever you guys want for questions. So if you have any questions on anything regarding Islam, doctrine, I'll be glad to discuss it with you. Since I messed it up so much. Um, one of my concerns is that, for instance, you hear that Detroit has gone so much Muslim. In order, and I understand that this has happened in England, how do we stop them from becoming the majority and therefore being able to bring in Sharia law because they also control the courts? Somebody has to bring a lawsuit, and if nobody brings it, then what stops them? Well, again, a lawsuit's not going to stop it. Legislation's going to stop it. I think there's a couple things we can do. First of all, America is supposed to be a melting pot, and it was. And we've gotten away from that with diversity. It doesn't mean union. It means division, diversity. All this multiculturalism and diversity. The other thing that we're doing wrong is we are importing, and we're trying to make up from a dis how we disparaged other nations for years. We allowed immigration from other Western countries. And so all of a sudden, there's been this thing since 9-11, we're going to try to make up for this disparity. We're going to import people from these countries that are Sharia here. And basically, we are importing, many times, Sharia-compliant Islamists, political Islamists. That's a huge problem. Basically, that would be like opening doors during the Cold War and say, send us all your spies, send us all your, all your, all your guys you want. Just send them over here and let them help destroy America faster. Um, like I said, there are some Muslims that come here to get away from that. And there are many that are very, very loyal. Americans that help us fight this are some. I say some, a handful. The um, majority, I think, go to the other persuasion. They are the they're political Islamists or they're those that just want to live and be, be silent and do their own thing. Um, to answer your question, I guess, we need to secure our borders. That's the first and most thing that we have to do. That's probably the greatest threat, this existential threat we have right now is people coming from existence. That's what I'm worried about greatest threat that we, we have right now is open borders, forest borders. That's one. Uh, two, we need to stop immigration with countries that are state sponsors of terror, which is the most of them. All the OIC states, all 57 Islamic states listed on the Organization of Islamic Cooperative, all adhere to Sharia officially, and they all want to implement Sharia worldwide. So I would stop any visa application from all those states, period. And I would stop doing anything with our education system. By the way, 
um, our education system in 1958, the North American Education Defense Act was established so that we could have people to learn to speak Persian, Farsi, and other languages in the Middle East so we could have intelligence operatives and counterintelligence operatives. The Saudis seized control of that years ago, over 40 years ago, and began taking and commandeering those programs, pumping, pumping money, first at the Ivy Leagues, like Harvard, Yale, and other schools, so they could take control of it, put who they want in charge, and what content was being taught. And right now, the Middle East Studies programs, all the way down to every community college level, to include right here in Florida, is controlled in, in, by the Saudi Arabians. So now it's pumping down into our education system and our local schools. I did an article recently on an English textbook, no less. Now, many of us know that the history books, and someone said earlier they were Brevard County, where our Act Chapter guys um, got the uh, some legislation, they got the school board looking at it because they had 58 pages devoted to Islam and only one or two to Judaism and Christianity. That's pretty much an epidemic nationally. After a two-year study of all 38 major textbooks, and that's pretty much the common on all major textbooks used. In fact, some of the textbooks teach that Jesus was a Palestinian and not a Jew, and one of the textbooks says that Jew, uh, Muslims and not Columbus discovered America. Actually, actually. So, this is where our children are learning. And it is tied to Common Core as well. Uh, right now, Qatar, I think, is probably the worst nation. It's supposed to be our moderate nation, but they are pushing much of this. Um, they are pushing the uh, schools um, to do online collaboration, and that's all being done in, in, in contact with Qatar and the uh, Georgetown's University Center for Christian Muslim Understanding, which is owned by, uh, funded by Prince Ali bin Talal in Saudi Arabia's Kingdom Holdings. So, um, we're getting killed in the information battle space. Would you recommend Robert Spencer's book, What Everyone Should Know About Islam? I would recommend all of Bob Spencer's books. He's a friend of mine. He's excellent. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, next. Hang on. We've got a mic. Oh, sorry about that. Right Has there been anyone in the U.S. penalized according to Sharia law? Uh, yes. And, and I think that... Um, some of the court cases we just listed actually just showed how they were they were injured in Sharia-compliant courts. Um, not in capital punishment, not physical punishment, but right now in family law and uh, de deprivation of equal rights, that type of thing. Would you explain some more about ALAC? Excuse me? Would you explain some more about ALAC, ALAC? American Laws for American yes. Courts? What would you like to know specifically? Well, where we can locate you on the web? Okay. What you're doing. The, the American Laws for American Courts, and if you want to, the um, Christopher Holton has written some excellent articles. So if you want to write Christopher Holton's name down, um, and Stephen Galay is the lead counsel on it now. And David Yerushalami was a friend of mine, actually drafted the original. Stephen Galay now is the lawyer over it, and Chris Holton is leading the charge out of uh, Frank Gaffney's Center for Security Policy, and he's really the liaison. If you want to speak with someone and get involved yourself, because I know you're a lawyer. Um, I would get a hold of uh, Chris Holton and Stephen Glay to help you do that. And the American Laws for American Courts, what we really need to do, one of the big things that we have to do, the, the Senate President is the key to this whole thing passing. And what I would recommend is that it, it, advice from Chris Holton was this. Every one of us need to be sending letters of thanks for him to, for putting it up and putting it through and that ask him to bring it up for an up or down vote. So he said, you know, if you want to send a couple of dollars a pledge, money speaks a lot, send a little small donation. He says, I would encourage people throughout Florida, send them a small donation and send them a letter a week or two later saying, hey, I really want to thank you for sponsoring ALAC last year, uh, being a co-sponsor with it. We'd really like to see this go to the Senate for an up or down vote this year and put a ton of letters and a ton of calls into him and encourage him because frankly, he's not going up for re-election, he's terming out. Um, threats are not going to work, and other other things aren't going to work. I think you need to thank these guys and try to get him, but he's the key to this whole thing. We've passed it in the House. We've passed it in the Senate for three years. And the Senate president has stopped it every year. Herodopoulos, two years, and now it, it failed. An up, it didn't go to an up or down vote this past year. Back here with Mike. You don't have a mic in your hand, you don't have a floor. <laughs> no, uh, I'd just like to make uh, two extremely important points. Everybody here, either your organization needs to go buy a copy of the Koran, 
where you need to go buy a copy of the Koran. This is a 30 minute exercise. Stop by and buy a copy for 15 minutes. It will only take you 15 minutes. You do not have to read the whole thing. Just thumb through randomly and read. You will find out everything this gentleman is saying is correct. They direct their people very specifically and the non-believers, they say Christians and Jews are not to be befriended, they're your enemy. That is what they teach in the Quran. Read it for yourself. The second thing, I don't know Randy, I saw him two years ago. If you'll just take what he's telling you and read the newspaper and think about what's going on, you will find out how correct he is. That's all I have to say. I want to first of all thank you, and I would also encourage you this. Thank you very much. The Quran is a little bit confusing, so while I would recommend absolutely getting the Quran, there's one book that I think that every one of you needs to buy, and I think you need to buy them and share. If you want to affect change, you need to be sharing this with your elected officials. It's called the Sharia Law Manual for Non-Muslims. It is a very small book, 47 pages, written by um, Dr. Bill Warner. Now, that's one of the only non-Islamic books that I'll recommend. Everything that I learned, I learned from enemy documents. I have the Quran. I have the Umdad al-Salik, which is the legal desktop reference book, if you will, because usually you have a desktop reference legal book, and then usually you'll have volumes of legal documents behind you, like the Tafsir and others. I own those volumes. So when I pick up that little book, and I look through it, and I look at Book 090, Jihad, Islamic Warfare Against Non-Muslims Who Establish the Religion, along with the Quranic texts that support that, it tells me to go to the Tafsir, and I can go through and open up volumes of more information that go into greater detail into that subject. Or if I look at the Book of Justice 12, 0, 12 2, it talks about stoning, and it will tell you about this. And by the way, the Umdad al-Salik I'm talking about is only $29. That is the new, second book I would recommend, because that is their legal book. It's called The Reliance of the Traveler, in English, the two L's, Traveler with two L's, Reliance of the Traveler. The second book is the Islamic, uh, the Sharia Law Manual for Non-Muslims. Now, the Sharia Law Manual for Non-Muslims takes about an hour to read, and it, it compiles everything. It will make you, if you read that book, you'll be considered basically, I would call you, a scholar compared to most of the other subject in, in America. Um, very succinctly, cuts to the chase, tells you what's going on. I would encourage every one of you to order a few copies. Act sells them, they're $8.50. If you buy them through Act for America, you sell them for $3 and you buy 10 or more as a discount. I would encourage you to buy one, read it through science, and start sharing it with someone and get it back every week. Give it to someone, let them read it, get it back, so you know they're reading and asking questions. That's one of the things that you can do to get educated and educate your elected officials on this subject. Are there any cases in the United States of Islamic polygamy or family honor killings that are going unprosecuted? Absolutely. Um, right here in Tampa, the Fatima, um, Oh, what's her name? Fatima um, Abdullah. I can't remember her last name, but anyways, the Fatima case in Tampa was a, was a perfect case. Um, she was killed. She supposedly banged her head into the coffee table so many times that she killed herself. But the first responders that showed up, she had broken ribs. Um, she was bruised. Hours went by before the police were called because the oldest male, because he's got control of the the women in the household, the son, it doesn't matter, his control over his mother, whatever. They waited four hours for him to drive back from Miami to call the police. Um, Bob Buckhorn, by the way, is endorsed by the um, Emerge USA and the uh, CDA, which is a, uh, a political action committee run by Karim Wahid, a former Hamas care member, and they support Bob Buckhorn and others. So what I'm telling you is that we have, in Florida, I would tell you is probably the second most infiltrated state in the Union as far as stealth jihad, cultural jihad of Dawah goes. Um, we're very bad, very, very, very uh, well infiltrated. Um, that's one particular case was, was uh, Fatima, what was your? Polygamy. Polygamy was that, that's what you're getting at. Polygamy happens, that was an honor killing that, that was probably covered up, but honor killings happen every day. Anybody remember Rifka Berry? The young girl that ran away from Ohio to Orlando was in the news? Yeah. Well, the reason it was in the news is because myself, Tom Trento, and others made it public, and John Stemberger got involved as a legal counsel. And that young girl, I want to say today, is living. She'll get U.S. citizenship soon. And if you talk about something that is a strong Christian, I get goosebumps, but you'll never meet a stronger Christian than a former Muslim that converts to Christianity because they do it under literally threat of death. And that's what happened. Her father was going to kill her. Her brother was going to kill her. 
and she came to Florida. We were able to get her help. We made it a national issue, and it prevailed in the courts in America. And this is another reason we need those types of laws on the books. So the other question was marriage, polygamy. Yes, up to four wives. Um, although Muhammad had 36, I guess it didn't apply to him. Um, you know, do as I say, not as I do. The fact of the matter is a Muslim, if he can afford it, can have up to four wives. It happens in America today. Usually what you'll see is a Muslim family, and they'll have multiple women there, some young. That's my niece or my sister's, uh, my wife's sister or my wife's cousin, and there'll be several women in the house. They get one marriage legally, and then oftentimes they'll go and have a Sharia court perform additional marriages. Now, it's going to be hard to prove, but yes, it does happen. Uh, we have no-go zones, just like they do in Europe, Detroit being one of them. Um, since there's, you said, 50 some odd Arabic states, that means that, uh, if I'm correct, that means that uh, in the UN, they have that many votes also, right? Correct, they control the UN. Right, okay. I understand, I just want to clarify it. That's the, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a big point. This is being driven, remember we talked about enemies. This is not a, a, a small thing, a common core all tied together. The largest organization in the world today is the United Nations. The second largest organization is the OIC, which has 57 Islamic states, which controls the votes inside the United Nations. And they are not working separately necessarily. In 2003, Carlos Ramirez III said, quote, or Carlos the Jackal, an international terrorist, he said, quote, it will take a coalition of the Marxists and Islamists to destroy America. And they set about doing just that. So they are working in concert. So when you see Common Core, and like my son was tied up in the Lexus Nexus, Common Core did online school. And I look over, the first thing I see on the right, the con school advertised every time I open it up. I start looking at the con school and start investigating some of these guys, and I'm looking at Islamists. In Jacksonville, we have the one of our great schools, uh, the Fatah Gulen. Anybody heard of the Fatah Gulen? Fatah Gulen tried to overthrow Turkey and bring it back to the Islamic Caliphate. He sought asylum under the Clintons. He's living in the Pocono Mountains, and now he has 130 schools tax-funded in U.S. soil. And he's multi-multi-billionaire, and he has schools in 80 countries, and he's funding the return of Turkey back to the Islamic Caliphate, and he's doing it in educating our children. And one of those schools is right there in Tampa, has one, Orlando has one, Jacksonville has one, and Gainesville, I believe, started, we've got two more now, recently, I don't know what the other school is. And the photo going to say, quote, this is a quote that he said, we must swim in the arteries of society undetected until we reach all the power centers. Because if we raise our heads too soon, they'll crush us. So we must swim in the arteries undetected and until we reach all the power centers, and then, and only then, can we rear up. This is Islamic standard doctrine. Smile on the faces of some, but we curse them in our hearts. We are oppressed. Muslims in America feel oppressed. These guys holding their march said we're oppressed. They're oppressed merely for your presence because you're non-Muslim. They are oppressed because they are not living under Islamic Sharia law. According to Islamic doctrine, we are oppression. We are fighting oppression. When a Muslim says, I'm fighting oppression, he's saying, I'm fighting your legal system because I'm oppressed living under it. I have one more uh, thing I wanted to ask you. I'm a veteran and I go to VA and my doctor... I'm sorry, I can't, I don't... What's that? I'm a veteran and I go to the VA and my doctor is an A-Rab. All right. Listen, so, listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't want to, I don't mean to be, I want to make sure that we, we are clear here. We have very many Arab Americans that are patriots. I do not want to be out of here bashing Muslims. That's not what it's about. When I'm talking about Islam or Islamists, I am talking about people that politically follow an ideology, a political system and not a religion. There are the two aspects. So that's what I was going yeah. to ask. Okay, I just, you know, I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. I just wanted to ask you, uh, if he's a practicing, practicing religion, then that makes him our enemies, right? If he's fundamentally practicing all the concepts of the Quran or right. all the Sharia, then yes, he's your enemy. If he is practicing only religious components of Islam, then he is not. But there is a difference and a distinction. But the, but it, and I know it's minute. I know we're kind of mincing words. But if a man walks around, he's got a zavita on his forehead because he prays five times a day. Those five part prayers, he is cursing Christians and Jews during those prayers, by the way. 
if he goes to mosque weekly and he adheres to Islamic laws like that, that he is absolutely seditious in nature. To answer your question. Okay, listen, we had a lot of people on a lot of questions. I don't know how long Randy's going to be, but our next speaker's already here. Got one quick question and, and, and make it very quick. We do have a mosque here in Lake City. It's about two miles down the road on the left. That's not my question. Under Sharia law, women are no more than chattel, are they? According to Islamic Sharia law, and there are Quranic verses that support that statement, yes. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for having me here today. I hope you will support the ALAC laws. I hope you get behind it. But I would encourage you to be very careful with your language. And I encourage you to take the knowledge and use it as what it is. It's knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. We are talking about political Islam. We are talking about foreign laws. We are not talking about, again, that law does not address Sharia or Islam. I bring it up and brought so much of Islam into it because those are the people that are going to fight it for the wrong reasons, and those are the Islamists that are trying to undermine our political system, our, our constitution. And that's the only reason I educate so much. But please understand, I am not. We have Muslims, Dr. Zudi Jasser, Taki Kami, and I can name Noni Darwish and others that have left the religion. Some are still Muslims and their faith that are very good friends, patriots that we work with every day. So please do not confuse an individual Muslim with a Sharia, Islamic, a Sharia adherent Islamist that's trying to destroy our country. God bless.